Ken Locke, Kurt Owens, Mark Wright, we're all pastors here yep. in the city, and we're together to model a conversation, a safe conversation of about course. race, safe and meaningful. So what does that mean? It means anything goes, we're going to learn from each other, and uh, we hope that, you know, with Black History Month, not only does this give us a great time to do this, but, yeah. man, we hope that this this goes on all year, Should. this type of conversation. <laughs> so, okay, let me ask you guys, why is this such a difficult conversation to have? Because nobody wants to have it. <laughs> Honestly, I think I think it's because uh, all of us innately have a defensive mechanism that whenever we hear a conversation that challenges us, we just shy away from it. And so because it's challenging to sometimes our beliefs, our facts, the truths that we hold near and dear to our hearts, we just would rather not talk about it. Like any other trauma, which it really is a trauma, you just rather not discuss it. Mm -hmm. So you feel that way? You would rather not discuss it? Most people. Yeah. yeah honestly. Mm -hmm. For me, a long time, I didn't. I mean, you just, it just goes without being said. You see it, you notice it, but I think talking about it only made it worse in the context of what I grew up in. So you just keep going. You feel the same way? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, to, to a point, I would say I, I certainly would agree with Ken. I think uh, the, the caveat would be people don't feel comfortable talking about it with the other. Gotcha. People feel comfortable talking about it with, you know, their, gotcha. their, their white counterpart or their yeah. black counterpart. Yeah. It's a comfort yeah. level there. But then when you begin to start having the conversations like this, it's like, yeah. am I going to be offensive? Yeah, you know, True. this is uncomfortable, depending on what, what position that you're in. And, uh, and, and so that's, I think, the dynamic that needs to be broke down and needs to be challenged mm -hmm. uh, in our communities and our society. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this because, you know, just, just for, let's say from my perspective, and it's interesting hearing from your perspective. I, I've never thought about it that way. Yeah. I thought there'd probably be more openness to talk about it. But there's obviously, from my perspective, there's not a lot of openness. Exactly. And so uh, I was trying to think about that. And I, there's a couple, th a couple thoughts I have on it. I don't know if this, but a lot of times when it's presented, it is you're a bad person because you're a racist. Mm -hmm. All right. So automatically that shuts people down. Yeah. All right. Right away. <clears throat> And the other thing is, is that I, I really think there, there is the, the uncomfortableness, which we know, I mean, this, what if I trip over my words? Am I yeah, going to say yeah, something yeah. offensive? We don't yeah. really know what to say and all that stuff. And then I think there's that, hey, I know that my story is going to be challenged in some way idea. And I think that's just really hard. Yeah. I think sure. it's a really hard, hey, this is what I know. This is what I'm used to. And yeah. now you're going to introduce me to something that is going to maybe push that or challenge. I think that's a really hard thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, like you said, it is uh, like natural to protect ourselves. So, you know, if it's if it's going to be challenging, you're right. Kind of just I would naturally acquiesce uh, for the sake of not wanting to go too far because I'm the person I'm super passionate. So if I feel like something that I believe or something I say is being challenged, I'm just going to just keep going higher and higher until, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and I think energy can sometimes be misread as hostility. Oh, you know? OK. So you're like, hey, I'm super passionate. I'm moving my hands. I'm talking. But you know I love you. You know what I mean? Like, like this is kid, like, you know what I mean? man. <laughs> <laughs> it's me, right? Like, you know, I can't, I can't help it. Millennial. Stay over there. <laughs> I, love you. I love how you blame it on the generation. That's it's really who, good. That's really it's just, good. That's just who we are. You know what I mean? Like, we can't. <laughs> that's really well done. That's really well done. Yeah, I, I like I said, I you just kind of look at the the openness like thereof. I heard. This summer, I was listening to a podcast. It was a Michael Hyatt podcast, and he, he was talking about race. And he had his human resource director, um, who was a black man, and he was talking about this. It was really fascinating what he said. And he said something that, for me, is, is I, will forever change how I approach this topic okay. with, with the church I lead. And he said this. He goes, I don't understand why people approach this topic uh, different than any other sin that they would approach. Mm -hmm. He said, most times you wouldn't get up in front of your church and say, you know, you are all prideful, knock it off, and you're bad and evil people. Yeah. Uh, he said, we know that this is a sin like every other issue, so why don't we approach it with, hey, there is a dark spot in your heart like there is in other sins. Yeah. So it's okay. God wants to, God wants to help you work through that just like he would all the other things. And so it was this, hey, let the defenses down. Come on. That's and good. be open to it because that's God good. wants to do a work there. I thought that was really well done. That's really good. That's really good. I think it, it like we talked about it earlier, kind of changing our perspective to approach it from a Christ-centered perspective and saying, okay, hey, no, we all love and serve Jesus. That's where our heart is. Mm -hmm. All right. And so we're going to go from that. With that being the foundation, 
we start looking and saying, does every part of our life align with the word of God and his will for us? And clearly, you start dealing with the race issue. It's going to be something that either you're going to just pretend it's not there and walk away from it, or you're going to be sincere and say, you know, this is something I need, I need to deal with in my heart. Yeah. So. yeah. And, and, I, and I would say specifically, I think when we're talking about race, we have to uh, be very clear. Are we talking about uh, race uh, in, a, in a secular uh, uh, dynamic, or are we talking about race from the Christian perspective? If we're talking about race from the Christian perspective, I think we got to come at it from, from a completely different angle. It's not necessarily just a race issue. We're talking about a, a gospel issue. Mm-hmm. And my problem has always been, it's not with the fact that there's racist people in, in society. That's going to happen, and that's going to be on all sides of the aisle. Uh, my problem is the, the that the issue exists in the church. I have very little expectations of the world. I expect yeah. the world to be what the world is supposed to be. I think my problem is with the church. And, and when we don't take the gospel and, and make sure that the gospel aligns with every area of our lives and including how we engage in, in uh, with 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 race, yeah. um, you know, that's that becomes problematic. And so I'm always leading off with the gospel because the gospel is going to address those issues that says, you know, my life matter. The gospel says my life matter. It says that your life matter and everybody else. It's not an issue that's separated from anything else. It's starting off at the gospel and we allow the gospel to impact how we live. And so that that's that's where it becomes problematic for me. It's it's the church that I that I have a problem mm-hmm. with gotcha. in, in dealing with this issue. And we shouldn't have a problem dealing with this issue from from the church's perspective. Yeah. So how would you push someone that said, or, it, you know, the thought of we're all concerned how it benefits us. Okay. Yeah. Why should someone be committed to having this conversation? I think someone should be committed to having this conversation, not just for the sake of having this conversation. I think someone should be committed to having this conversation again, because one, it's a gospel issue, but two, it, it, I always say that uh, people that are not having these conversations are uncomfortable with having these conversations. It's only because they don't have a relationship with the other. Mm-hmm. That's where the problem lies. Yeah. Like now, if I, now, if I had a problem, um, I mean, if, if, if the situation was because I'm in relationship with you, this matters to me and where you're at because I'm in a relationship with you. This is not just those people. Yeah. It's like, no, man, like my guy Marcus on the other side of the yeah, team, man. Yeah, like, hold sure. up a minute. Hold sure. up. Uh, like, I know him. And so I'm always speaking this encouragement, like, man, people really need to be in relationship with the other because that's like, you're not going to get it in a book. You're not yeah. going to get it by watching a movie. Like, you have to be in relationship. And once you become in relationship, now you have permission to have these conversations because these conversations are now being had from a place of love, respect, and honor for one another. And again, it goes right back to that gospel, that 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 gospel centered uh, perspective. Hmm. What do you think about that? Uh, man, I, I agree with a lot of it. I kind of it reminds me a little bit of like the. Uh, do you agree with the old sage over here? <laughs> 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 yeah, I think I think he says so much. So I'm trying to like figure out you know yeah. which angle I want to take because there's like there's 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 the gospel issue and like of course you know don't want to go down a rabbit trail of historically, but you know the the the, the church has been divided from its conception in the American church. I mean, the evangelicals, the Protestants wanted the slaves to be saved, but if, if they accepted them as being their neighbor, then they couldn't be slaves anymore. So it's like, I have to I have to keep a separation and saying, well, what's happening to you is normal because mm-hmm. I kind of fixed up my mind. So that's, that's that side of history, which I, I believe still has bled into um, some of our habits, not necessarily our, the- our theology. Our theology was corrected, but our habits and what is our norm is still bleeding from what mm-hmm. happened hundreds of years ago. And then when it comes to relationship with the other, it reminds me of like the Jonah and Nineveh. You know, he was he just felt like there was no need to have a relationship with them. You know, it's not <laughs> they're over there, <laughs> we're over here, and he felt like he was good. Of course, honestly. They were really bad people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was like, you know what? But honestly, I'm happy you said that because I think a lot of people still think that way internally. I mm, think that's well that's said. Good. 
You know, I think they still think that way internally. You know, it's like, ah, those are really, you know, really bad people. You know, <laughs> the earth would be much better with them. And, and, and no one has the guts to say that, right? Like, you could be a Christ follower and say that out loud. But my God, some of your thoughts will imply it. Some of our habits. Well, and you of the felt ways. that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can, uh, it's so funny for me because I, the, the way that I've gotten treated, I guess I'm a millennial, right? Mm -hmm. And my hair and stuff. And so they're like, oh, when they find I'm a pastor. They're always quick to, oh, Mike, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were a pastor. <laughs> it's okay. Like, As if, what does that mean? What is the difference? You said I'd love to be anyway, yeah. right? Like, I didn't do anything wrong. I said hi. You didn't want to speak. Like, ah, it just looks like he, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you try to take something from me, uh, but but it's this reality, and I'm okay with it. I laugh it often, but it's this reality. But the reality is, it's not funny. It's not funny. It's not funny. I've I've just I found a way to love people, be, you know, beyond their personal shortcomings, and I think that that's all of us. Where real grace comes in in these conversations, that's going to have to be the foundation. If you ask me my true personal opinion, if we don't enter without grace, we won't get anywhere. Because grace has to be in there to say, you know what, I have to allow you to speak your truth while having a truth of my own and figuring out how do we find community and how do we find communion while both still realizing we may see different sides of the same coin. Yeah, that's so good. Gosh, that's so good. I, you know, I was, talking, I was talking to some friends of mine a couple months ago, and they were, they were trying to learn more about how they can develop relationships with people of different skin color. Yeah. Okay. And so they were uh, part of this organization, part of this group. And then uh, they were telling me their experience of it, and they were like, well, we backed out. And I said, well, why did you back out? And they said, because it became political. Mm -hmm. They were going, they were assessing where they were politically versus the whole thing. And they were like, since when did this become a political issue? And I said, and, and I thought about that. And I thought, I've created this term now that's a part of this conversation, which I think makes it more difficult, political profiling. Mm -hmm. yeah. That now you start to even put that junk in the middle of this con already difficult oh, conversation man. and it becomes more difficult and people start going like this even more. Yeah. And they back like, what does that have to do with this? Can't we just have a conversation and can't we just, you know, and I felt, I felt terrible for them. Come on. Because they really wanted to, but they felt like they got put in a corner and they were like, I'm, I, I don't feel safe anymore. It, that's gone here. It's, 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 it's unfortunate because. In so many instances, what, what I've seen in the church is what's political, people think that's the gospel. Mm -hmm. And what's the gospel, people think that's political. <laughs> It's like, and then this is the danger. Man, he's deep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think this is the danger of, of, of us embracing the world system oh, too much. Absolutely. And, and you know, and I, I think the church has been called to be separate. And, absolutely. you know, when Jesus came on the scene, the two political forces that were around at that point in time was Come the on. Sadducees and the, the Pharisees. Pharisees. Come on. He slapped them both or <laughs> <laughs> slapped them both around. In fact, they came together to Correct. kill them. Correct. <laughs> Correct. It's a team so, effort. <laughs> so when we start talking about like gospel issues and gospel issues beginning to start to look like they're political, um, I, yeah, I, I think we we we've got to go back to the drawing board and really begin to start looking at our, at our theologies and where Absolutely. we're coming from, and and always like to lead off with the gospel. And you know, people may get tired of me just keep talking about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. But it's the only. I mean, it's my refuge, and it's the yeah. thing again. I, you know, if I didn't offend you, give me about five more minutes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> because yeah. that's what the gospel does. No, it's a, you know, at the moment that you're giving me applause, just yeah. give me five more minutes. I'm going to make you angry because that's yeah. exactly the gospel does not just uh, align with your side of the aisle. No, absolutely. I think that's powerful. I mean, like, like you said, leading with the gospel and, and the Bible says that the government should be on his shoulders. And so like our, our government, our politics, which when you start thinking like, politically saying as, as far as just where do I stand, which is really politics, you know, how do I vote or where do I stand? We should always vote with love, grace, and I, the gospel. Yeah, I'm like, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Cares? Like, it, it just doesn't matter yeah. to me if, 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 if love and grace is the, is the foundation of peace. You go into a challenging conversation of saying, how do I love someone I don't completely understand? And I think that's, that's what the real gospel is, though, right? Because I don't, I don't have to completely understand you to love you. If I do that, then... Our ministry, our outreach would be terribly shortened because we will never be able to reach mm. a certain group of people if we don't understand that. that that's so good, mm. man. As you were talking, the one thing that, I, that just came to mind is like J Jesus commanded us not just to love our neighbor. Come on. But he said to, to love your enemy. Come on. 
And so if you look at the other side, you're like, oh, you know, I don't think I could deal with them. If they, if they look like an enemy to you, then why aren't, why aren't you loving them? It just blows my mind that Jesus said, like, you know, uh, there's two things. He says two commands that fulfills the whole law. Come you on. got 613 Old Testament yep. laws. And he says you can fulfill them with two. And those mm-hmm. are the very two that the church has failed at. Yeah. Love God all your heart so much. <laughs> and and, 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 and you it's, three preachers together. It's, 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 you know, one of them's going to break out. It's, <laughs> it's so simple, yet we've taken a simple concept and made it too complex. Correct. Correct. Well, it, you know, it's it's interesting when you were saying that because, you know, the love your enemies thing, I mean, we see that all around. I mean, we see the church just dividing politically. And then, uh, but you know this from a racial side, and I think you brought that up, Ken, that some people see someone doesn't have my same skin color as their enemy. And yeah. so I never even thought about it from that perspective. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because I, the last thing I want to think about is someone that is a different skin color nationality is an enemy. But, I mean, the reality is that's... That's some yeah. people. That's some people. Based yeah. upon their experience. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I think there were there were times we were doing some stuff in the community where I talked to some of those who were like work, working with, you know, activism in the community. And some of the things they said to me was so was so refreshing. And this was not coming from the church. Hear me. This is not coming from believers. But <laughs> um, he was out doing some work and one of the ladies came to him in tears and she said, hey, you know. To be honest, I have been a racist, you know, my entire life. And the reason I've been a racist my entire life is because I never had a relationship with anyone that was black. Mm. And she was like, just being able to walk and talk with you and seeing your heart, not for yourself, but for community. Mm-hmm. And she, with tears, said, I'm sorry to you. I apologize to you because you are a good human. You know, and, wow. and that's powerful. And I, it, 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 it touched me Ooh. deeply because I, I felt love. <laughs> You're telling me the story. Like, wow. Love and acceptance that sometimes I feel like has been like pulling teeth to get believers um, to, to, to do the exact same thing, which is really to open up themselves and to say, you know what? Let me just have a conversation. Let me just have a relationship. I think you and I, Mark, I mean, this started from us just having heart to heart conversations. I mean, you guys knew one, one another way longer, but just the conversations that we had and just say, hey, you know, I remember you telling me, Ken, I don't, I don't know, but I would like to know. Mm-hmm. Let's just have a conversation. But I just think we shared heart to heart. And for me, like I walked away from one conversation saying, man, that's a brother. Right? Like that's a brother. Not because that was so I, that was so powerful for me. Man, it was. was it really, so really powerful was. For me. It was, it was, it was uh it was life-changing for me. And I'll say I don't use the term life-changing very, very loosely because people kind of just throw it around. But the reason I say life-changing for me is because I felt a love from from you and and very first few conversations that, you know, within to be honest, the black church community, I haven't felt as much. So, you know, it for me it was like, you know, God was breaking even greater barriers within me to to more than just saying that's a brother, but that's someone I can lean on and build strong and substantial relationships with. And so more than the surface thing of saying, oh, I accept you for who you are, but you stay at your church, I stay at my church, or you stay with your community, I stay with mine. We start having conversations and saying, like, what could we do together? And to me, that's what it really, that's where you really start changing the world and saying, how do we come together to, to really break this divide, but breaking it by, by showing what love looks like when people can get over themselves and realize the, the work of the gospel is so much bigger than my one small, even though it could have been traumatic experience. You know, you I still remember I was sitting in the garage, sitting in my garage at home, and you and I are talking. Yeah. And uh, I, I always remember this because this I I was mo- I was I sat in my car and I cried mm. because you, when we got off the phone because you said to me you go I've never had anybody fight for me like this yeah. and then you said uh, I'm not used to this you said you're my brother and when I say that I don't say that lightly so yeah. I and I, I could just hear it in your voice and there was something about it I mean you know I've had, I've had close friends close white friends white yeah. pastor friends and all that stuff and you know we've exchanged you know um, things like that yeah but there was something about that. I don't know what it was that there was, it was yeah. just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I went in the house and my wife's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, yeah. and I told her what happened. And she's like, oh. Yeah. And uh, it's and funny I, you say that. I, my wife asked the same thing when she saw it. <laughs> it's funny you say that my wife, you know, because just being transparent, you know, my wife, she, she knows that I'm not the kind of person where you just, I'm super friendly, but not open vulnerably mm-hmm. with everyone, if that makes sense. So she knew, like, if, if he said this, I, I want to meet the guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because... my wife was the same way. I was just, I was just, like I said, it was just unbelievable to me. I just, yeah, I, I yeah. just, 
Like God just really rocked my heart. Yeah, but it's your, it's your love, bro. I mean, the, the, the very reason we're here having this conversation, it comes from someone who says, I want to see what I can do to be a part of the change, you know? And honestly, we can all talk about seeing problems on the other side of the field day and night. Yeah. But unless you actually get into the fire and say, you know what, I want to be a part of creating change, then it, the same really is you are a part of the problem if you're not a part of the solution. And that is very, very true. That if you're not actively trying to say, what can we do to make it better? That what I'm doing is saying, whatever it is, I'm telling God I'm okay with it. Hmm. All right. So I want to I wanna talk about, I want to get personal with this, but not first, okay? Because I've got some <laughs> questions that popped in my mind. I really want to hear your answers about how do we be a part of the solution? How do we inspire change? You brought it up. Yep. That's great. How, how do we do that? Because otherwise, we'll, we'll put it in the hands of culture, and we know, and you, as you talked about, you know, we don't want them leading the conversation. I think the local church should be leading the conversation. Absolutely. You, you, you've got to be intentional. Uh, when, you, when you're talking about uh, integrating relationships and breaking down the barriers of, of race, you have to be intentional. Yeah. And, and what do I mean by that? Like when when when, when I launched Bridge Builders, I, I had this mindset that like you know I want to have a diverse board, and I I clearly said you know um, when I, I gotta have like three white men, I gotta have three white women, I gotta have two black women, three black men. Like I really broke it down like that, and it sounded very discriminatory. <laughs> mm-hmm. But if you look at my board, you will realize that. Yeah discrimination is the furthest thing from the truth. We're, we're yeah. a very diverse board because I was very intentional. So if I lose a black woman, yeah. I'm going to replace that board member with yeah. a black woman. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be discriminatory in order to be intentional about, uh, you know, having this, this, this racial synergy. So it's not discriminatory. It's intentional. It's yeah. intentional. I think we have to be intentional. And it's the same way with our relationships because specifically in Milwaukee, we, we live in a segregated community, but that should not stop us because we have the opportunity to have, uh, integrated relationships. Yeah. And so even though that you live in a different community, you and I still get to have an opportunity to be in a relationship with one another. So we have to be intentional about yeah. having and establishing relationships with the other, because if you don't, again, you're going to miss it from a book. You're going to miss it. And all you ever hear is the voices that reinforces, you know, how you may have been raised Come and on. And and we all have that. Yeah. And so until you start being in relationship with people to have different perspectives yeah. and you're intentional about that, you're going to have a very limited scope of, of, of our society. Yeah. And so you've just got to be intentional to be uncomfortable. I mean, um, you know, maybe you go to uh, an all black church. You might be the only one. Everybody going to be staring <laughs> at you. It's OK. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> or maybe you go to an all white church. Yeah, everybody might stare at you. You might be yeah. the only one, but it, it opens you up to begin to to step into some of those relationships and being uncomfortable. Yeah. But at the same time, it it it, it broadens your view. It broadens yeah. your, van, your your lens. And so, if you're not willing to be intentional, then you're willing to just stay where hmm. where where you're at currently. Come on, I, let me. I got to. This is so good. I just wanted to say, you know, when I was in elementary school, we did a thing called pen pal. Did y'all? I know I'm a millennial, so y'all probably. <laughs> Y'all went to school, elementary school, like 20 years ago. I really appreciate you just, why don't you just say, you guys are older. Why don't you just say that? All right, so you guys are a little bit older, so you were in elementary school, probably was like a 15 year gap. You and I should just be having this conversation, you know? But we had pen pal, and I loved it because I remember like yesterday, my teacher having us write these letters to someone across the world that was saying, hey, you need to build relationships with people who don't live like you do. And... To me, I still live my life the exact same way. One of my closest friends in the world is living in London right now. We started from social media and have been ridiculously close off of social media conversations. And now I consider that like my sister and I'm like a brother to her, you know. And uh, I think when he talked about intentional, sometimes when a person says, all right, I'm going to get up and go to an all black church, you know, and I'll be the only one in there for some people like, you know, they're bold. They can do it. Others are probably like, yeah, I'm not. Just, I'm just not going to do it. I don't, I don't have the courage to, to you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid of the music. I'm afraid of, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a culture shock. But you could, you know, social media is a powerful tool. And you really could start conversations through a, a, a social media message and just saying, hey, I just want to introduce a conversation and saying, hey, I see that you are a believer, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And just saying that we can be a relationship. You would be amazed how many people are so much more open to social commu- uh, no, social media communications as opposed to face-to-face face face. because it's less invasive. 
So you think that's the way to start? I absolutely believe it's the way to start. I believe it's the way. And I think it's it's easy because it doesn't cause a person to come too far out of their comfort zone. What it does is it introduces conversation. I believe the conversation is just the beginning. And when a person gets a chance to share hearts with the other side of the of the the table, they get a chance to realize, wow, both of us are just bleeding hearts covered by the blood of Jesus. Mm. You know, and all of our experiences may be different, but it doesn't mean that neither of us experience trauma. My trauma may be different from yours. Yours may be different from mine, but if it wasn't for the love of yeah, Christ. Yeah, we really are the same, aren't we? We really are the same. I, I tell you, I would be, this is a fascinating thing, because we talked about, you know, black, white churches, primarily black, white churches. I would be intimidated as hell to preach at one of your churches. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I have no problem you guys coming here. Really? Oh, yeah. I'd have no, I'd have like, yep. But I would be as intimidated as hell to go to one of your churches. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why? There is no, why, why is that? I don't know. I don't know why that is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You're afraid somebody go scream at you like, hey, man, there, are you'll be okay. You'll be good. You'll you'll be good. good. No, they okay. scream and they leave. Yeah, when they scream and they leave. But no, okay. I would, I would. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be okay. Because I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen some, some, some guys that's like, like in, in the black churches, like, don't, don't, don't kill me with the theology. Give me some application. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even talking about but you're, pretty, you're pretty good. Well, you're, you're, well, you're I'm pretty not even talking about, I don't know what, what I, I would think that I wouldn't be able to, I think it's a cultural thing for me. Rel- relatability, you're saying. Yeah, oh, I nice. do. Okay. I, okay. And I don't know why that is, but that would be like, we can sit and I'm with you guys and I love it. But man, if I got into that environment, I'd be like completely intimidated. I mean, it's, it's just, it's uncomfortable because it's putting you in a different you know, space. Kind of the same thing when I became the, the chaplain for the Bucks and, and now, you know, you're teaching the He's gospel. Name dropping, you see name dropping. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 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 I, this, this is only for the sake of giving an example. Here. Oh, I know. No, that's, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> no, I needed to say this because it was different for me when I when the room became all millionaires. And so their faith issues are different. You know, so it's like when you're teaching faith and now you're really going into like not trusting in uncertain riches or like oh, it's, a, yeah. okay. it's not not building yeah. your kingdom mm-hmm. here on the earth. And okay. it really is a it's, it's mm-hmm. not a different gospel, but the the. The direction almost the, in, in which you're presenting the gospel has to be different because these are now people who sometimes don't feel like they need saving. Yeah. You know, and so the way you present the gospel has to be different. And, and I, I, I get that dynamic. Um, when, when, when I when I pastored at my first predominantly white evangelical church, um, it it was it was it was daunting for me because how I how I was used to preaching. And, and delivering the gospel, it was just encouraging people for another week. They, they, they would be, yeah. you know, just just keep them encouraged for another yeah, week. Then yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be able to pay my bills. And, Come on. Like, I ain't going to get put out. And now all of a sudden, I'm, like, I'm this preaching to so corporate rich. executives. Like, they don't need any encouragement that they're going to rent, going to get paid the next week. And so, like, all of a sudden, I got to come up with something. <laughs> that speaks to them. Exactly. Relatability. So yeah. that is uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah. So do you feel that? I mean, well, you you spoke here and, and you speak. Well, I mean, do you, well, do you guys I used, feel that? Well, like. And initially I did, but but because I'm used to speaking to mixed audiences now, okay. like I'm, so I'm you're more open. familiar. Okay. Yeah, I'm a little bit more familiar with it. But initially I wasn't. And this goes again to that that intentionality. And yeah. so you have to be intentional about going to speak to uh, an all black church, mm-hmm. so you kind of know what it's like to, yeah. to address. Do you feel that? I mean, would you feel I, that? I know what I I I did, and sometimes I still do, but not necessarily like where it's just overly nervous. I just know that I'm a high strung person, so you know, I'm like, hey, I hope these people are ready for. <laughs> I hope they know who they invited. <laughs> <laughs> we know, know. <laughs> we know. We know. <laughs> you know, that's what. It, but but for me, I'm super comfortable in the skin I'm in, so like I'm okay being me, but I'm also okay loving people how they are as well. Mm-hmm. So. It's a, so you're good with that. Yeah. yeah, I'm okay. That's really good. That's really good. So how does, in, in the white community, a white person, how do they get past the, I'm, I'm always going to be told I'm wrong. I'm always going to be told, you know, this is my fault. I'm always going to be told, in that conversation, how, how do you get past that to have that conversation? Mm, I got a lot to say, so I'll let you go. <laughs> Stunning. <laughs> you, you, you know, I, I, and, and I think a, a, a lot of it, and it's, it's hard for me to really even speak to because because I'm not white and, you know, I, I don't live with the thought of like, I'm going to be blamed for, uh, you know, what happened, um, well, less than 200 years ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, and, but but here's the thing, if if if. I would say that uh, it's it's one thing feeling like 
taking the blame for that pain and that trauma, but it's another thing for actually experiencing that trauma. I would much rather be on the other end, yeah. being blamed for the trauma that's that's tied to my right. family lineage, as opposed to as opposed to experiencing the trauma. Yeah. Like I, I would consider myself. I, I think I've done pretty well for myself as a black man, but I'm traumatized yeah. by the history yeah. of my lineage, yeah. and and we never really speak to that. Um, so I, you know, I can't allow my trauma to go away to make other people feel feel better and, yeah. and, and not feel blamed. And, and when I have conversations of race, I never have yeah. conversations. Like, there's nobody here that, uh, there's there's nobody here that exists that had anything to do with slavery. Um, so yeah. so I tell my white friends and, and white audiences that I speak to, that like, hey, you shouldn't feel guilty because of the slavery that, that has transpired in our country. You shouldn't feel guilty for uh, the Jim Crow era. I mean, you didn't, you didn't create mm-hmm. it. Uh, what you should feel uh, a concern for is lament. I want you to lament with me. Oh, that's powerful. That that's what I want. Man. Yeah. Would you would so, you lament? Okay, so, love me. Yeah. And lament with. Tell me, me what that looks like. I, I think it looks like us sitting having conversations. Like, well, what are what are some of the struggles in, in in your community? And being open to hear what that is, and 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 uh, you know, because you, you would never know what it's like be a dog unless you're a dog <laughs> like and, and i don't it, that was probably a bad analogy <laughs> because i'm not comparing black people to dogs I'm just gonna, that's, a, that's a terrible oh, analogy i, I, I didn't so, say it that's all i gotta say man so, so let me let me let me let me Sour let me let me, yeah, let me let me change that uh, but 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 I, I but I but I but I think the the point uh, of, of that matter is it's like man when you when you carry the burdens of one yeah. another like like in, in in our church community if somebody's hurting in my church community like we're we're all hurting we're all bleeding uh, for that individual in that ch- in that church community but but that's what we do in our individual church community but when we look at the big C church yeah. like if you got a the uh, demographic of people in the big C church and we're hurting we're brothers yeah. and we're hurting I mean I would you not lament with me yeah. as opposed to saying like why should I take the blame for mm. what happened to you wow. um, Ooh, you I never perfect. thought of from that perspective oh Ooh. smokes cool. that's really good you said you had a lot to say. Yeah, I mean, but I don't want to back that up. That was a preacher's point. Oh. Right <laughs> you know, that's, that's that my was, drop right there. No, yeah, that's really, it really good. It really is. I think uh, he said, I mean, Bill, you want another's burden. So, I mean, looking at it from the lens of actually loving one another and saying the, the, the responsibility of being a believer and being in Christ is that we ought to remember that we're one. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter what your skin color is. Like, we are all one in Christ. And so when one is hurting, we're all one body. And no. If the foot is hurting, then the entire body is off. If the arm is hurting, the entire body is off. So mm-hmm. having that same kind of love, and I see it once again, there's a lot of the work that we do with the community. I, I know that it's possible, and maybe my expectations are high with the church, but I know it's possible because I see people who are not believers exercising this out. We saw people who were white who came to the protest. One young lady, I'm not going to say her name just for the sake of protecting who she was, but she was. She said, like, hey, my great-grandfather was a, a slave owner here and and she named the property and everything that was still give, even given to her. Like, she's like, I own this stuff now. And so, like, she used it to do- donate to helping the community and those that were broken. And she walked with them. She said, because I want to understand what it's like, and I can never understand if I, if I never walk with you. I can never understand. And for me, that was just so powerful because I saw someone exemplifying love who had never heard the gospel. Uh, and I, I think that for as believers, sometimes we are really, really good at creating greater excuses when we don't mm. want to, to, to do something. Um, and uh, the, I don't know how, or I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure that's what the disciples were saying when it was time in, in the book of Acts. I don't know how, but it's like, just go, go onto the highways and hedges and like, just compel, you know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you your, your marching orders and exact words, say this to bring something to Christ. Like when you go and you be a relationship, there's a connection that happens there. And so, I agree what he says. That, that lament with you. Really you know, good. when you when you brought up the lament thing, I can remember sometime this summer. I think it was it was probably the Kenosha. It was probably Kenosha, and I was calling you guys. And as I was calling, I think it was you, Ken, and it called Raymond and all that stuff. And you guys kept talking about burdens. 
yeah. and burdens and burdens, carrying your the, the burdens of your people. And you just kept talking about that. And uh, and we we were we were talking about it and how can we help carry the burdens on. But I remember just getting off the phone going, that's something that as a white pastor, we just don't mm. we don't do well. Yeah. And then just to hear you talk about that and then I kind of step in that in a very small way with you. Yeah. Uh, I just it was really it was very enlightening and very powerful. Yeah. Not, I mean, yeah. that wasn't even crossing my mind Got until you. just listening to yeah. you guys, until Got I'm you. able to step into it with you guys and just going, like, man, that's, I'm incomplete without that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think one of the, talking about the burdens, that was a very, very, it was burdensome for me, but not like a negative burden, but a burden that I believe God gave to me to, to want to help the community is that what, I'm a big community person. I believe every church should be a community church, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. And that the kid, we're right, right, we're here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there, there you go. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no words. He yeah. knows this. He knows kingdom. Um, but this, the cry of our community was asking, where is the church? So you don't, you don't understand. To be a pastor and to hear the community scream saying, you know, you, you guys are so boisterous on every other topic. You know, you're, you're boisterous on our sin, who we're dating, who we're loving, how we're living. I mean, you have a lot to say. And then people die, at the, you know, in the street. And they're like, eh, it's not really something we want to speak on. Or rather mm -hmm. just speak on the things that we feel like mean more to us. Not someone's life. That doesn't mean that much to me. It's more so about what you're doing, you know, with your life. And mm -hmm. so there were people who were coming, you know, coming out in tears. And we were out. We were active with the community. And people were saying it as a compliment to me, but I actually started crying. They were saying it as a compliment. Like, you know what, Pastor Kid, you're the only pastor we know. They came out to make sure we were okay. And you were the only pastor. And they were saying, like, we appreciate you. But I was sitting here thinking, like, there's 2,000 churches in Milwaukee. I was the only one. You know, it, it was it was more so burdensome. I mean, I thought that for sure there would be several pastors seeing this broken community and saying there is a way that we can bring it, that we can love. And I, I remember them responding with riots and being angry because they did not have a leader. That's that's what you do when, when you're broken and you're hurting. You respond the best you know how. But in one simple conversation with them, they were able to understand there's a better way to approach it. And you really, you, you realize that it's just a community that's lacking love. Like mm. it really is a, a loveless community. They are, they are so aching and bleeding and hurting to be heard and loved. And I think that that's where the church, you know, as far as carrying the burden as a leader in our community, and I, and I don't know if it, it really speaks to a, a predominantly white church, but the burden of having a community saying, we don't feel like you care about us. You know what I mean? Like, and you're here, you're in the middle of where everything's happening and, and we don't hear it from you. You say absolutely nothing or your congregants or at least a representative. If you can't come out, Pastor, just someone that says, hey, our church is praying for you. We are here. If there's any way we can partner, it's what we want to do. So it became a burden for me. And I found myself out there every single day. And somehow I got labeled an activist. I even got maced one time. I don't even, I don't even know how. I was walking down the street and then I got maced. And I was on the side of the street waiting for 30 minutes to see. And by the time I, I realized I could see, I didn't know what happened. I was like, I don't, I don't know what oh, happened. Man. You know, but it's it's that, it's the, it's the that that burden because now you have to decide, all right. Do I not love to avoid a label? Mm. You know what I mean? Or, or do I say, I don't care to heck with the labels. I'm going to love like Christ loved. And that's going to go out into the world and be where Christ was. So and, that burden. And, and here's the thing. When, we, when you talk about that burden, and, and I think this is where the church has completely been disconnected from the community with which it says it serves. Most of the people driving in anyway. Uh, but the, because when we say that we, we carry the, this this burden, it's like the, the community speaks mm -hmm. what on. it needs. Come and on, instead, dude. you know, as, as churches, we would decide what the community needs. And, and that's how we respond to it. And, and and I think one of the biggest things that ended up transpiring, even during this, 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 this last um, uprising, was the fact that the church wanted to lead. Yeah. And there were secular leaders Come that, on. That, that were leading. And Come so on. as opposed to coming to see, you know, how can we serve and how can we love as opposed to like being the next Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> Come on, don't get me started, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man. I, 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 I think there's, uh, yeah, there, there's, there, there's a huge gap there for the, the 
when we say we have a burden for our community, then you need to listen to the voice of your community Come and find on. out how can I best well, and, serve my and, community. And you know, as you as you guys talk about that, I think that's one of the things as we as we talk about the importance of this relationship. Yeah, it takes your perspective and it just blows it up, which is yeah. you know really a good thing. And I don't know if this is a me thing or a, a, a white black thing. I don't know, so I don't know the answer to this. But you guys think so much more communal. Mm-hmm. Where my default is automatically individual. I got mm-hmm. you. And just talking with other white pastors, I just notice it's the same thing. Got you. And so when I hear, you know, you two and uh, Raymond and some of the others and talking commute, I'm like, this is the way it should be. Yeah. And yeah. so I just, like I said, I, I think there's something. So when you're talking about, you know, here in the, the, the needs of the city and the cries, of the, I, I just going, that's what we should be doing. And why wasn't I ever taught how to do, you know, and <laughs> well, to, to speak to that, Mark, you, you have to look at it like, man, I, let me just say, I mean, I, I love our country, but I think what we, what we as Christians, we do a poor job of separating, um, uh, the elements of our country from the elements of our Christianity, mm-hmm. the elements of our country, it pushes individual power. Yeah, it, it, it pushes individualism. You can become and do anything that you want to do, and it's going to push us to do that. And and but my the Christian element says it's we're a collectivist society. Yes, that we we pray for one another, that yeah. we love one another, that we share each other burdens and all of those things. And so I think we just as 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 a Christian community, we need to put that in 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 its proper context. While it's great on one hand, I think if if, it go, if we allow it to get a little too wild, then you know we we, we ha- just have an individualist Christian community mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> as opposed to a collective. That's really well said. I, th- I feel like that's I feel like that's what I was. You guys were challenging. Yeah. I mean, see, in a loving way, but just listening, and I think I feel like that's what you guys were challenging. Yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. And it was really good. Yeah. Uh, a couple more things, and then I'm going to go to the lightning round. Let's okay, go. and this is going to be <laughs> tough for the lightning round. Is going to be tough for you guys. So you're going to answer questions in one or two sentences, and you get the preachers. It's just going to be <laughs> all right. Hey, what are some good things when it comes to race that are going on in our city right now? What do you see? <laughs> this right here. <laughs> I, mean, my I love this. I mean, I do. Yeah. I couldn't wait for this. Honestly, if you guys agreed. I couldn't wait for this. <laughs> no, no. Well, now you're going to make me toot my own horn, Mark. Oh, <laughs> I didn't mean to do my own horn, but here we go. 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 Media hog. Media hog. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. I think one of the greatest things that that's happening right now, and I, I hope it serves as a model for more to happen, is like I, you know, I really had a heart to see black and white church planters to come together and to establish, you know, a, a multi ethnic church from inception. Yeah. Um. I I think. The platform of the church is the greatest place to be able to create those relationships and for people to begin to start having uh, an opportunity to meet the other. And uh, so I don't mean to toot my own horn. I'm saying that because I want to see more of that. Yeah. Um, and and the fact that it's it's happening, um, it gives me hope that it can happen more of that. And so I, I think that's a good thing that's happening. The other thing, good thing that I think that's happening is we're starting to see a group of urban and suburban pastors, black and white, yeah. um, beginning to start to have relationships with one another. And I think that's a, a really beautiful thing. And uh, just glad that I get an opportunity to be a part of that, man. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of what God is doing in our city in spite of the fact mm. of all of its negative um, statistics. Yeah. Well, you should be tooting your horn on that, because that's, that's, that's awesome. I, yeah, I love that. I yeah, love that. Yeah. What, uh, what do you see? Um, question this is for the church or just the city overall? Uh, what do you just see in, in our city that's good news when it comes to race relations? Uh, man, I see a lot of uh people coming together. Honestly, for me, I've been seeing a lot, and it's being it was warming for me once again, being a part of seeing so much of the activism. And you saw some of the protests, and blew my mind to go to if we had 200 protests, 60 to 70 percent of the people were white marching for the lives of other people. And that changed me. It really did. I mean, because- You never thought you'd see that day. I never thought I'd see it because I would talk to my own community and, and, and you would see some black people say, ah, I support y'all, but I'm not going to get out there. You know, I support, but you know, it's just not that important to me. Or I got something else to do. And I'm like, the world is shut down. It's a pandemic. What else do you have to do? You don't have a job. You don't have, <laughs> you know, what do you, but and you, and you get out here and you start seeing other people 
who aren't from the inner city, who are from uh, suburban communities. One young lady said, you know, her father literally told her, if you go to the protest, don't come back home. You know, if you're going to mm. you're going to march for black people. And she was like, well, I'll move my stuff out tonight, mm. you know, and so passionate about seeing equality. Uh, so I really do feel like our city is being primed right now for change. And I think if the church doesn't take its rightful position, other people will take it. Mm. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. It's not. it's not a good thing. We are supposed to be the head and lead. And, and Jesus is the hope of the world. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> but he's the hope. And it's our job to introduce him. Mm. So. All right, here we go. Lightning round, let's go. Lightning <laughs> round. One to two sentences. Hero you look up to when it comes to race relations. Easy, it's Martin Luther King. I'm like a... I would say Martin Luther King. <laughs> I'm sorry. You couldn't come out, you couldn't... <laughs> there, there is nobody else in <laughs> right, right, That's right. my guy. All right, all right, all right. Like, <laughs> he's never Martin Luther. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, someone says to you, I don't have any friends with a different skin color. How do I make some? What do you say? I would tell them to sign up for front row seat with basics. It's an opportunity for them to be in relationship with the other. Okay. Here's his three sentences. Do I get it? Okay. No, no, he's, uh, he's penalized. He's penalized. <laughs> <laughs> social media. Social media is the number one way. Where in social media? What Insta do they do? Instagram, Facebook, add a friend, start a conversation. Okay. How do you, how do you begin that conversation? Best way to begin that conversation? Transparency. Hey. I'm having this conversation because I really want to learn more about the story of the other side, if you're willing to have one. Most people say yes. I would agree. I would say authenticity. Just be honest and upfront of what you want from the beginning. Okay. And just kind of a, and this is off the uh, the lightning round, Reddit, but <laughs> do you ever feel, how do you feel like if I came up to you and said that to you, how would you feel? Uh, I'll, I'll be willing to have that conversation. Okay. You too? Be absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Must read book on this topic. Mm. Honestly, what is the author's name? It's Total Forgiveness. J Jamar Tisby, are you going to say the color uh, compromise? Oh, what is his name? But it's a book called Total Forgiveness. Oh, okay. That uh, that that breaks down, you know, our ability to love is usually hindered by what we haven't forgiven, and. Mm that would be foundational for us to really get over the not holding you as the blame for what your ancestors did and loving you for being a new identity and a, and a born again believer mm -hmm. and a brother. I think it's foundational. Mm. And uh, I hate reading, <laughs> <laughs> but I hear Jamar Tisby color of compromise is pretty good. It's really good. He said, I hate reading. <laughs> Hopefully not the Bible. Yes. He listens to that, I'm sure. I enjoyed that. <laughs> Thank Wonderful. you for confessing that. <laughs> one way your kids, one way your kids' experience around race is different than yours. I live in West Bend. <laughs> I live in, I live I live in West Bend. So the community that uh that my kids live in, like most of my son's friends are white, which I didn't get a white friend to high school. So for him, it's totally different where you know, most of the things that are on my childhood, what he watches on TV, like when he watches the Martin Luther King movie, he, he's asking questions like, why are they doing this to him? You know, my yeah, friends. Because for them, this is normal for them. Oh, it's super normal. Yeah. Of, you know, all of his friends are, he has friends of all ethnicities. So I wanted him to have that so that he wasn't raised mm. with this kind of stony heart as to me, my people, and no one else. Mm. What about you? I think my kids, um, I can't say that their experience is much different from mine, actually. Mm. I, I can't say that because... Yeah, I've, I've been in uh, Milwaukee, pretty much. Okay. So. I'm going to give you two the last word. What do you want to say? Mm. Is, anything, is, is this anything preacher that, kid or is this regular this brother kid? I, I, <laughs> so it's the last word. No lightning round. It's, it's open up. It's open up. Uh, the younger has to wait, so I'll let I'll, uh, He defers. <laughs> he defers. No, I, I get to get a benediction. You, you go, go, you go, 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 go. I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> no, I, I, I would just say, I, I think, you know, I appreciate having the opportunity to have uh, conversations around race and uh, helping people to, to have the courage to have those conversations. And just really, the, the, the thing for me is, is, is probably a repeat. I, I, I deal with race and I address race from the lens of the gospel. And, and I think uh, once you begin to do that, you open yourself up to allow God to, to steer your heart on how you should be approaching it and how you should be interacting with it. 
And uh, I think with the gospel as the lead off, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult for us to go wrong in it. Yeah. So not my opinions. I leave my opinions at the door. I leave like my, all my preferences at the door, but willing to submit myself to what the, what the gospel has mm. to say about this. Mm. Yeah, I would just say, don't let this conversation be a waste. You know, don't let it die here. I think it's easy to have these kind of conversations and say, oh, you know, that was a great conversation and click off and go back to whatever, you know, whatever you were doing, you know, but I, honestly, just to be challenged and say, if anything you heard, just if it sparked something in your heart, if a little fire within your spirit to say, you know what, I got to be better. I want to, you know, be a part of the solution and not a part of, it, of the issue, do something. And even if it's that simple sending a friend request, right, that's like super easy. It's just one finger, it's one button. Um, but at least it starts because once you get, once you get started, it actually opens you up to realize that there is something beautiful waiting behind the other side of that door. We're gonna have because he's the young gun here, so we'll we'll defer to you. And yeah, yeah, I've heard you. I've said this to you before. You are, are I mean, you already are, but yeah. you are the future. Oh man. Okay. It's, so it's uh, we're 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 just kind of watching you just grow and usher in, and <laughs> your influence. And I'm still knowing your notes, but don't hear Yeah, me. no way. And so why don't you pray for our city? Wrap Absolutely, like right now, right now. This, this People are going to be watching this. Don't threaten you don't me with a good God, time. You think God just you pray now and that's it? I mean, don't, you don't threaten me with a good time. Is what I'm saying. Prayer is a good time for me. That's just it. like do it up. Let's do do God. it. God, we are absolutely excited, God, to even have this opportunity uh, to come together as brothers and just to cover our city. And so, God, we cover our city. We cover our county. God, you said every place the sole of our foot treads, it belongs to us. And so, Lord, we believe that this city belongs to us and consequently belongs to the kingdom because we are here. And so we're praying, number one, God, for those who represent the kingdom in this city, Lord God, that we will find greater ways within our own congregations, within our own families to go beyond our comfort zone and to say, how can I connect with a brother or a sister that doesn't look like me, but find a greater relationship in the beauty of who Christ is in them. Father, help us to see that you are calling us to this for a reason. Let this not be another conversation, oh God, that we hear and we just cast off to the side or that we hear and say, you know what? There was good information, but nothing struck me to actually change my behavior. But Father, let us hear this, this conversation. Let it be something that stirs and churns within us, Lord God, to begin to do something different, to find greater relationships. Look, God, we cover the city. We speak for a greater grace to enter these conversations, a greater uh, experience of love, God, for us to really love our neighbor as ourselves, for us to do, as Pastor Kurt said, Lord God, to lament with one another, mm. to be in a space of saying, you know, mm. even if this doesn't personally affect me, uh, let me sit with my brother or my sister and just for a moment, uh, see if I can handle the weight of what their heart is carrying, Lord God, that we could cry and pray and worship together. Father, we're covering this city right now that in the next 20 years, it is going to be completely different than what we see it right now, Lord God. It is not going to be the other side of a coin, but it's going to be a new coin. It's going to be a new city. There's going to be new life, new breath, a new spirit, God, of togetherness, of unity, where we will come together, God, and love this city as you would see fit. God, this city is aching for you. It is aching for you, Lord God. There were 595,000 people in this city. And we are just crazy enough to believe that, God, you can change this city with more than just 10%, more than 20 or 40. But, God, we're believing, God, that this city can be radically changed when the men and women of God come together and we fight for one kingdom, and that's yours. We love you with everything that we have, and we submit to your will today. In mm -hmm. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.